Good morning, everyone, again. My name is Arthur. I'm a proud Brazilian, and despite the state of my country in the moment. And <laughs> uh, I'm a software developer for Lumi. It's a company based in LA, and we do Pure Script and Haskell for like a supply chain in a box experience. And today we're going to talk, and today and tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, type safe and better DSLs, domain specific languages in both Haskell and Pure Script, but uh, like all the concepts are applicable to both languages. And uh, I have a short program here. I think I should click here first. Okay, yeah. I have a short program for the four sessions. So, like, oh, it's cutting a little bit, but it's not a problem, I think. Um, in this first session, we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, domain modeling and DSLs. What makes a DSL and what makes a good DSL? We're going to see some examples uh, of like embedded DSLs in Haskell. Uh, the second session, and I hope this second session, I believe it's going to fit a little bit in the first slot. Like this is not organized by the slots of time we have because some sessions are shorter than others. Uh, in the second session, we're going to play with a real-world DSL, just so you can get the hang and the feel of it, of how, how it feels to use a DSL, and what does that mean, what's that entail. And then we're going to discuss the techniques used on that uh, DSL briefly, just like so you can get a panorama of how these things work under the, the covers. And then I'm going to talk about language-oriented programming, because this DSL we use at Lumi, it's, it's like, it's used inside the setting of language-oriented programming. I'm going to talk about all of that. In the sec third session, I'm going to talk about type-safe embedding. We're going to, s to, to see how to embed little languages inside Haskell. And we're going to see a little bit of some techniques for like type-safe embedding. And that means like how can you get correct DSL? How can you enforce correctness in the types? Uh, then we're going to develop a small DSL for validating business rules. And that means like uh, validation rules and also like, uh, I don't know, you have a, a set of events in your application and you want to have an easy and comprehensive way of like dispatching some actions after some events happen, validating that those events are valid, etc. And in the fourth session, we're going to see a small DSL for uh, developing chat box using indexed monads. And that means that we can encode the protocols uh, that guide the functioning of the chatbot inside the type so we can't write invalid chatbots at all by any means of what we define is invalid. And that means like the chatbot follows a protocol, etc. Uh, we're going to modify and extend the chatbot DSL a little bit and then a short wrap up and conclusion. And like after this today's sessions, I'm going to uh, ask you exactly for what you expect and what you want better from the sessions from of tomorrow. So let's get started first. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask who here is a software developer, software engineer, who here is, has worked in a commercial setting with software, like developing software for companies? Pretty much everyone, cool. So you all know what a domain is, right? So, uh, okay. So by domain, I mean here throughout all these series that I uh, suppose we have a problem that we want to solve independently if it's a problem for, for a company, if, if it's a problem uh, we consider our, for ourselves, uh, for someone else. But every problem we want to solve with software, it has a domain. It's the set of things, the set of problems, the set of considerations, and including the set of solutions we come up with. All this comprises the domain that we talk about, or the model as well. And these domains, they come in all shapes and colors. Like, uh, we have... Uh, a bunch of domains ranging from testing, validation, financial services, all of this, all the way up down to architectural modeling. It depends on what your problem is and what your company does, uh, what problem you're trying to solve. And all of these domains, they come with their own intricacies, with their own entities, with their own uh, things that you care about, their own problems and their own solutions too. So uh, it's almost cutting. <laughs> and it's our job to translate all of this down to code because we're software developers and we must come up with a means of like understanding that domain first and then translating all of that into code in a way that's reasonable, that works, and that's maintainable, that's correct, etc. And language is what we use to do that, whether it's a programming language, whether it's a description language, whether it's like just talking to product managers, uh, whether it's in documentation, specification, whatever, language is the fundamental basis of all of that. And so, 
imagine we don't know anything about the world besides like basic math arithmetic. So if you look at these two sentences, you might say uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and then 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot dot dot. Some of you might understand the first sentence as like just a symbolic representation of 1, 2, 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. I should have added also like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1,234, because some of you might also think that this plus means concatenation. Some of you might, may, might understand that it means addition, so you might assign the meaning to that sentence of 10. Some of you might understand it must just like do one pass in the, the addition sequence, so we get uh, 3 plus 3 plus 4. Some of you might understand that we want to just add some parentheses to that, just make the association explicit. Some of you might not assign any, any meaning at all because I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why, but you might think that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 means box. In the second sentence, for example, some of you might understand that the dot 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 does it means like the rest of the sequence of all natural numbers, so you might assign the meaning to that second sentence as infinite. Uh, some of you might think that dot 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 means just 4, just copy what is above it, you know, because this, these two superpose like one on top of the other, they also mean something, right? So some of you might think that the dot 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 means four as well, just like in the first one. Some of you might think that the dot 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 doesn't mean anything, so it's, it evaluates to six. Some of you might understand that it, we should make the association explicit, and etc. If we consider this language now, like box box, some of you might think that box box means a box inside a box. Some of you might think that it means a box above a box. Some of you might, mean, might understand that it means like a box with double the size. Okay, so what I mean with all of these, is, these examples is that, oh, I've added some cool effects there, but it doesn't show because of the colors. It's a shame, whatever. So what I mean by all of this is that language is defined by syntax and semantics. Syntax is what we see, what we manipulate. Uh, it's what guides the structure of what we say, of what we write, of what we read, of what is considered a correct sentence in a language. And the semantics means which meaning do we, we assign to each sentence, to each part of the syntax. And given this definition of a language, this hand-wavy definition of a language, we can think that a DSL, a domain-specific language, is just a domain plus a language, right? So just domain plus syntax plus semantics by transitivity. <laughs> and when we're talking about programming, specifically Haskell and functional programming, when we want to develop a DSL, we want to develop a language like inside Haskell, we often model syntax as data because that's what we can manipulate, what we can write, what we can read, that's data. And semantics, we often think of that as like a function from syntax to whatever meaning we think is appropriate. And here is a simple example. Uh, I'm not wanting you all to understand this from the first impression now, I'm just giving a panorama of what it, all of this is. So here's an, a basic example of a simple language. Like we are modeling just a simple language for Boolean expressions. And it has these, uh, these three elements here that combine Boolean expressions like and, which is uh, the, the, the normal and operator, the or, which is not the normal or operator, and blah, which we're going to see in a few seconds. And we can like inject a va uh, normal Boolean value from Haskell inside this language. We can lift it from Haskell to this language. And this first thing here, this data definition of syntax, it defines an abstract syntax t, syntax tree, an AST, is what we, it is called, the, the abbreviation. Uh, and this defines basically how we can write sentences in this language. So I should have added an example here, like for example, uh, or maybe we can, we can code this, live code here. I'm not sure, I'm going to try this later then. Uh, but we can come up and write short simple sentences like for example, or parenthesis and parenthesis val true, close parenthesis, own parenthesis, val false, Close parentheses, close parentheses, and it's going to be like true and false. And I forgot to add another sentence, but it could be like uh, val true. So it's going to be true and false, or false, or true. I don't remember what I said, but like this, all this whole thing is going to represent data. And what can we do with data exactly? 
we can like feed it to a function, we can evaluate it, we can analyze it, we can peek inside of it, we can read it, we can write it. But in the moment, since we have data, we can like understand it, we can evaluate it. So the second part of our language definition comprises the semantics, like what meaning exactly do you assign to this abstract syntax tree, to this AST, to this expression, to the syntax. And we define this for that for in this simple example by pattern matching on the constructors of our language and recursively calling and assigning the meaning of the Boolean expressions. In this case, I chose to assign the meaning of not to blah, but it could have been anything. I could have added just like, I know, uh, A with uh, A and itself, or I could have added and A and true, A and false, whatever. Uh, so it's not sufficient enough to know the syntax of a language. We have to also know what meaning is being assigned to it because a lang the way a language is understood, it depends on how you interpret it. It depends on which world you, want you interpret it, which meaning you assign to it. It's not sufficient to just know the syntax, to just take a look at it. You have to understand how it works. Uh, because like, for example, another possible interpretation for this language would be we could like print, pretty print this abstract syntax tree, tree, this tree of expressions. So instead of assigning a meaning of Boolean values to this, this tree of expressions, we could have uh, assigned the meaning of like strings and we just like pre-print these expressions with uh, logical uh, connectors. Uh, is everybody following so far? If you have any questions whatsoever, please ask, please interrupt me. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, can everyone see like that this expression thing here, when we like construct a value of x per, it's going to be a tree. Okay, cool. Because like a recursive data type, which has like more than one node in each expression, so it's not like a list, it, it branches. Okay, so another view of a DSL, like it's obviously like a consequence of the first definition of it, that it's like a domain plus a language. Uh, I forgot to add a domain here too because it's a DSL, but another valid definition of a DSL is primitives plus composition plus interpretation. And primitives plus composition comprises the syntax and interpretation comprises the, the, the semantics, obviously. What I mean by this is that not every uh, part of our syntax needs to be inside the data, the proper data definition of our syntax. Like in the same way that in English uh, and in whatever human languages, we have like composite meaning to added to stuff. Like for example, we can say it is very hot today. Like this very doesn't actually need to be a definition, a proper definition in our, in our syntax tree, but it can be like derived from the, from the elements we have in that syntax tree. We can, for example, like say that it is uh, a lot modified in some way, you know, that we have defined in our syntax tree and that gives the meaning to very, which combined with another adjective or another adverb gives another meaning, another value inside our syntax tree and inside our primitives. So <clears throat> another way of thinking about these DSLs is that we have uh, this data definition that comprises our syntax and uh, a set of combinators, which are things that take other values outside perhaps the domain of our language and the primitives, uh, the values of our syntax and turn to other values of our syntax, which we can then feed into an interpreter and evaluate that, extract some value, some meaning, whatever meaning we decided to be. Any questions, ideas, anything? Okay. So one example of a, a DSL, now we're talking about a specific domain, like Boolean ex expressions is also a domain, although a pretty boring one, so here's a more interesting one. Like suppose we have, we work for a company in the financial services field. Uh, we're now in charge of modeling like a DSL for contracts, for describing contracts. So we could model a simple example. I haven't thought through this much. I just like brain dumped whatever I thought was appropriate for like contracts and <laughs> financial services. So suppose we have in our set of valid contracts in our company, we can handle transfers of money from one person to another person. We can sell a product from one person to another person and a product supposedly has a value. We can sequence contracts so that like the state of the world depends on how exactly you evaluate those contracts because, for example, if a person transfers all their money to someone else, how can they perform a contract after that? They can't because they don't have any money. 
this is in our business set of business rules. Uh, we can freeze a contract, uh, we can cancel and void a contract. And this is the definition of our syntax for our DSL. And these are some possible meaning assignments to them. These are some possible interpretations, some possible semantics for this tiny language. We can calculate the whole value of a contract, of a sequence of contracts, like what amount of money does it move around the world. And we can perform a contract for whatever notion of perform is. We can, like, I don't know, store that in a database, transfer, transfer money worldwide. Uh, we can simulate a contract to see what's the state of the world. This should be actually maybe world because uh, a sequence of contracts could not be valid. And we could validate contracts beforehand as well without performing them, without peeking into the next state of the world, getting perhaps a contract error or nothing if it's valid. So, does everybody like understand this, follow this? Okay. So, the goal here with DSLs is that we can encode business rules. We can encode the domain rules in both the syntax and semantics. Because if we peek into this, exam this example, like we can't transfer money from a person to a product. We can't transfer a product to a person. We can't transfer money to another per from a, a person to another person in no date, time, whatever. We can't transfer no money. We could, but I'm assuming not from this definition of the, the data type money. Perhaps it could involve a data type. It could be a data type that doesn't accept the zero value. So, but we can also assign, uh, encode these domain rules in our semantics. And it all depends uh, on which value, on which type of value do we interpret, it, do in we interpret our rules. Like for example, if we were performing a contract and instead of returning IO of unit, we could return, for example, maybe IO unit. This could also mean that our contracts are not always going to be performed. Like IO unit could also mean like pure nothing, pure unit, so, but let's pretend it doesn't mean, but you can see that the, the, the business rules that we have are encoded in both the syntax and the semantics. Another example could be like uh, calculating does a contract does something different, like regarding the money than validating or simulating does. We could, for example, when we have a cancel contract inside the sequence of contracts, we could, for example, think that, uh, I don't know, uh, we're not going to get a valid world after that. That could be not inside our domain rules. Our company could want that. And these requirements change over time, right? We're all software developers. We know that what chaos means. And so we all know that these rules change over time. So it's good to have this separation so that we can like, have two places where to encode some different parts of domain rules. Like, for example, some more static rules can uh, belong to the syntax where we know that it's the core to our business, that money always exists, that transfers always goes from one person to another person. If that changes in, uh, no, for, uh, tomorrow, for example, we want to transfer money from one person to multiple, we could just add an array there to our syntax tree. That's, that's I supposedly obvious, I think. But the goal is then to encode these invariants from our domain in the, both the syntax and semantics of our language. And we must not uh, forget that the human factor is always present because like, we still don't have machines that code. So syntax sometimes, and most of the times uh, I'd say in my own experience, plays a big role because it's what us humans see, is what, what's, what us humans uh, code, it, what is what, us, what we see, it's what we manipulate, it's what we read. So syntax cannot be like forgotten, like we cannot like, make the syntax tree into a whole mass so that people can't, uh, can't understand it while they code, they're coding, whatever. And you have to also think about correctness by construction. And correctness by construction means that we must ensure when developing a, when abstracting a domain, when creating a, a DSL, whatever, that all values that we produce that are going to be fair to an interpreter must be valid beforehand. They can't be invalid. Like for example, if instead, um, if instead of like transferring money from a person to a person, we had like transfer from person to I don't know, animal or like a set of things. Like imagine the type of all types, right? 
we couldn't transfer money from a person to anything else other than a person. So encoding these things in our syntax tree and also in the combinators of our language and what uh, like in the things that given a piece of the syntax combine those another, this piece of syntax syntax with another piece of syntax that's it's important to encode correctness by that and we're going to see all of this by the third session I believe like how to use types to encode these things um, so now that we know what makes a DSL, uh, we should know what makes a good DSL. This, like, this stuff is in papers. I think I've linked a few of those in the, the references. Uh, so a good DSL is usually simple. Like People can understand it because it's a domain-specific language. It must not be totally expressive. It must not be capable of expressing all things that a human language can of the human thought. So that's why you have domains, right? That's why you have abstraction so that we can simplify things so that we can like uh, be able to understand all of this at a glance so that we can be able to understand the whole DSL by looking at it, by experimenting with it, by playing with it uh, for some short period of time. And a good DSL has also to be concise. It must not, not contain any contradictions. Like you, you must be able to follow what's happening from it. It must be conforming and that means that it conforms to a set of rules whether they be business rules, domain rules, or, or I don't know, world rules, like they can infringe the law. Uh, but that's uh, hopefully encoded in the domain rules, otherwise your company is not a good place to work for. Uh, these, uh, a good DSL is composable as well, and that means that given some expressions, we can always construct larger and more complex expressions, and we can hopefully construct programs using all the base elements of our language, using the, the, the primitives of the syntax and the combinators. And the composability part is the one that's the trickiest, I think. It involves a lot of like creativity and intuition, which is like the case for whichever abstraction tools we consider. Like domain modeling is a hard design problem because it involves a little bit of creativity, of domain understanding, and also of like technical knowledge and all that stuff. And it has also be, to be correct. You must not be able to describe any invalid expressions. The meaning of those expressions could be invalid, though, in the same sense that we have some sentences in English that are perfectly valid syntax, but they don't make too much sense. So I forgot the, the classical examples. Uh, I don't know, green butterflies or whatever. Uh, furious green ideas sleep furiously. Exactly, that one. That doesn't make any sense, although it's pretty much valid syntax. <laughs> what is it again? Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So, yeah, we must be able to encode this correctness uh, for whatever notion of correctness we want to consider because all of this is like it's arbitrary. It's whatever suits us better in a, in a specific use case. And, like, a good DSL, given all those constraints there, those soft constraints allows us to express some problems using the specific vocabulary, which comes from the syntax. And it gives us these simple but composable words so that in, like, with any human language, like simple English, for example, which is a variant of English, it has only some simpler words, some simpler grammar rules. It gives us some simple words, but that they compose well. They, can have, they have the same expressive power as of that of English, although like, that's debatable. But uh, and it lets us build our own systems, our own programs, in our own words. So it lets us uh, define our own sets of things that we can reuse and whatever. And this is like trivial for embedded domain-specific languages because like we have, we're putting languages inside of another language so we can use the constructions of the host language to like define things, such as in the case of Haskell, for example. And why do you care about this? It's mostly to make things simple, to make things fast, pretty, and correct or any combination of the things above it. Like the most common ones are like simple, pretty, and correct. Nobody seems to care too much about performance sometimes. Uh, it's the thing that's the most common. And so some examples of like DSLs, we have two categories of DSLs, although uh, it's like we have external DSLs and internal DSLs. External DSLs are DSLs that are like, they're just like any normal programming language except that uh, they're restricted to a specific domain. Some, or arguably most of them, are not capable of performing 
all computations. Some of them are just data description languages. Some of them are just configuration languages. But the thing is that all of them have a domain that they belong to. And they solve a problem. That domain does solve it well, arguably. Not all of those. But uh, some examples are like HTML for describing text documents on the web. CSLs for assigning style sheets, for, for describing style sheets, assigning styles to visual elements on the web. SQL for like developing query, writing queries uh, for the database, so that we must not like, I don't know, instruct Postgres how to fetch the data and how to join the data. We just tell it what we want to have, and it does that for us. We have make files, LaTeX, Vim, language, Elm, Doll, and Solidity. For example, and in the case of embedded DSLs, of like internal DSLs, which is another terminology used, we have a few common DSLs that will, uh, some of you might know from prior experience, which are like, for example, Parsec for describing parses, uh, HSpec for describing tests, persistence entity syntax, which is used for like describing entities which are going to store, be stored in the database, and we, we can fetch those entities and persistent provides with a bunch of uh, utilities to, to manipulate those entities. Uh, escalator, which is a DSL for writing type safe, arguably type safe because it has a few bugs, uh, type safe uh, SQL queries. <laughs> and uh, servant routes, which allow us to define uh, type safe web APIs. And it's pretty cool because it's a type level language. We're going to see it shortly. So this is an example of like a short program written in Parsec. We can say that it's a program because it does its own thing, and when interpreted, it produces some results which can then be interpreted into another language, which is Haskell. In the same way that we say that a program in Haskell is a program despite it needing to be fed to the operational system to be run, etc. Um, so, can all of you, can any of you, some of you, try to understand the meaning of what this does just by looking at it? Okay, so this is a, a small uh, a small program that just like passes what is considered for someone to be a valid receipt recipe. Uh, so it just takes a string like thing first, and then it matches is made with like we describe that a thing is made with some ingredients, and we have a, a, another parser for ingredients. And then we say that it's prepared by, and we grab another thing and the steps for, for this recipe. And this is what, like, this program is able to pass recipes in this valid syntax which we have defined there in this parser. So, um, this is another example for like HSpec. It describes a, 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 a spec for, I don't know, this is like sample from, from the website, but it describes like a sample spec that we can use, a sample, uh, um, I forgot the word is going to use, but uh, it's basic test suit. And I believe pretty much everyone which is familiar, who's familiar with Haskell can understand, derive at least one set of meanings, one meaning that it can be assigned to these expressions here, right? Like it's describing a, a test suit, and we're describing a few bunch of test cases here. Here's a property test that says, says that they're in the name, and we're just basically evaluating and uh, asserting these conditions and trying to see if they're valid. This is an example of persistence entity syntax. It describes like a bunch of entities that we have in a database that we can query for, that we can save in our database, you can update, select, whatever. And, sorry, uh, we can see that it, uh, it uses, for example, indentation. Syntax is, doesn't matter too much until it matters. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, we can also derive some meaning from this from just by looking at it without knowing what it interprets to. This is an example of uh, a SQL query written with Escalator. Uh, it basically translates to SQL text, but with the exception that it's a little bit type safe. Uh, and this is an example of, uh, of servants typed route, where we can uh, describe a web API just by 
like describing the roads in the type system. And this like provides us with two roads. One of them like pays a new user to, to the system. Uh, the other one updates another user. Uh, and it provides us some rules as well that we can like group these things, whatever. Uh, so the basic lesson from this, all of this is that if we have a set of things, a bunch of things, uh, and we have a means of combining them, and also a means of assigning meaning to those things, although I think that every human being is creative enough to derive some meaning from an abstract expression, but we can say that that is a language. Uh, yeah, anybody has any questions whatsoever? Mm -hmm. It's uh, sort of just a macro thing embedded in Haskell. Yeah. Does, does that sort of count as like an external DSL? Like you would have HTML and macro. I, I don't think it counts as an external because you you'd have access to Haskell modules and Haskell types from inside it, and the other way around too. You know, you can part, you can that ter is turned into an expression Haskell into values in Haskell. You know, so you that's not external because you have this language integration. And you can you reference know. your Exactly. Awesome. And yeah, I forgot to mention that for whoever is not familiar with this, there's this template Haskell, like this thing here is called a quasi quote, and it allows us to like write anything here inside, and we write like this sort of a plugging that passes this expression and turns it, turns it into valid Haskell code that can be, that like is copy pasted basically inside this, this module. It's a macro. Uh, and this is very powerful, but I'm not going to talk about it because, like, I think it's a little bit hard, and I'm not very familiar with it too. So, does anybody have any questions about any of this? Cool. This is rather short. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a very hard question because like abstraction in general, I'd say, and uh, domain modeling, writing s maintainable software is uh, a hard design problem, it's a hard problem. But in my experience, in my prior work experience at least, like when you, have, when you can identify this sort of closed domain, and this is the hard part, you know, you, you must identify subdomains inside a large domain. Whenever you can do that and you evaluate whether that domain is well contained within itself, if it's composable, if you can describe it in some sense, you know, if when thinking about that domain, about the problems that dom in that domain, if you can reason about those using simple terms, using a simple language in your head, then I'd say that it's an appropriate case for DSL. But like, you can do that with pretty much anything, so it really depends on your creativity, but like, and well, like the definition of what a DSL and what a language is is rather blurry too, because you can look at anything and say that that is a language, you know, but uh, it depends on how exactly you use it, how you enforce its use, and how like you teach people to use it. Uh, the settings in which you normally use those things is important too, because otherwise you could just like write a bunch of functions in Haskell and say that it is a DSL. It could be, right, because you could like have uh, like a bunch of functions that all of them produce some types and some, some, some data types, some value of the type, and you have another function that translates all of that, like that takes this output data type and gives something else. That is also a valid DSL, like data definitions for syntax, for example, they don't have all to be uh, don't have all to be data definitions like this. You can like consider a type synonym, for example. We could uh, express this same DSL here, the same DSL here. We could express it with like just type expert equals bool and have just a few combinators, like for example, val takes bool to bool, it's going to be the identity, and just takes bool to bool to, uh, just takes expert to expert to expert, and that's a type synonym. So it's just going to perform the, the, the and operation inside there, and that's called a shallow embedding. We're going to see that uh, by the end of today, I think. And like, this, that's not very much interesting, though, because you wouldn't be able to like 
derive other meanings from that same expression. Like, because in this case, for example, so since that we, we represent this, this, these expressions as data, we can assign whichever meaning we want to them because like, we have this abstract notion of what an expression is. So you can evaluate that to Boolean values. We could have uh, evaluated those to integer values. We can evaluate those to, to string too. But when we, like, it's a very, uh, it's a difference between like, uh, defining syntax in terms of syntax, in terms of data, and in terms of a semantic domain. And a semantic domain in this case, like string, for example, for this print interpreter is our semantic domain here. Uh, bool here in this case is our semantic domain. It's the difference between defining syntax in terms of pure abstract syntax and in terms of uh, the semantic domain. Uh, so I think I, I was led astray a little bit from what your question was. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it's a hard question to answer, but I, I think uh, I'm not sure if I, what I said was enough. With it, I'm not sure, but like these sort of things, are, it's pretty much with any abstraction tool. Like you, all of you are supposedly learned to program, learn to develop software for companies, and to abstract domains to write professional software by practice. And also, this is another abstraction tool. So it's not something that can be teached in the same way as maths can. It's something that you can like practice and see examples so you can like get this vocabulary of what can be used in which case and how you can use all these things. It's rather blurry, yes, I have to admit that. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? I think we are okay in time. Um, the examples use very different approaches. Um, like I think um, Parsec used these applicative combinators, and mm -hmm. then I, there was also template Haskell and these higher order functions. Mm -hmm. I think the four takes a select. And is there any of these approaches that you would usually prefer? Yeah. So we're going to talk about these things in more detail later, but it always depends on what exactly you're trying to express in a DSL. And by that, I don't mean that, sh that more is better. I mean that less is better. Like, what exactly do you want your users, the users of a, your DSL, not be able to do? Because since we're talking about correctness and type safety here, some of these combinators, for example, like monadic ones and uh, applicative ones, they differ in what exactly they can do. Like, for example, uh, I'm going to, talk to explain applicatives and monads later, uh, today or tomorrow, I think. So for those who are not familiar with them, like an applicative, the difference between an applicative and a, and a monad is basically that you can, with an applicative, uh, sequence contexts and effectful actions or whatever you understand by a context. Uh, you can sequence them and have a final, the final value of a program depend on the values produced in each step. But you cannot like make a future step depend on the result of the effect of the context produced by a past step. So it means that the sequence of steps that you perform, they're always statically analyzable. You know, so that you always have this defined sequence of what exactly is going to be uh, your side effects, your, con your final context which is produced. Uh, and that's different from monads which can do that. They can like sequence actions which like, for example, one effectful action, one contextful action it can, provide, it can uh, produce a result that is then going to influence how you change the world after that. You know? So the effects, the context, the future context, they can depend on past values. And that means that monads, monadic uh, expressions, they're not statically analyzable, so you cannot know what's going to happen beforehand if you, your whatever notion of context gives you some non-deterministic meaning. So that's basically the difference. Like, Whichever techniques you're going to use, it depends on what exactly you want to restrict. You know, it, for example, uh, these, none of these like, use pure applicatives, so I'm not going to be able to show the difference, but like, I'm going to talk about that later in the, the forms DSL, because suppose you have uh, some web forms, like, I should better just show this picture here. Like, suppose you have a web form here, like, we need to, suppose, 
we want to always have this, this same shape, like our, the shape of our form cannot change. So it's more appropriate to use an applicative DSL in this case, right? Because you're not going to be able to change the shape of the form from the values that are produced by each field if you assume that each field is a side effect encoded in the applicative, right? So that's basically the difference from these techniques. And I'm going to talk about all of this during the course of these sessions. It's mostly an introduction. Any other questions, please? Nope. Yeah. What's your favorite DSL? My favorite DSL? <laughs> I don't know. I really like the forms one that I'm going to show, <laughs> but that's perhaps because I've worked on it a lot too. <laughs> so it's like Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know. <laughs> perhaps it's that. Uh, anybody has any other questions? Okay, uh, so I'm going to start with a second session beforehand because uh, I'd like to get to the third one today a little bit, but that's not a problem if we can't. And just going to do a little short introduction. We're going to see now and play with a real world DSL, which is a DSL for forms that we use at Lumi to build these interactive web forms. It has, although despite I've, I have mentioned uh, that it doesn't support like changing the shape of the form. It does support that, but we're not going to see that today. Uh, so it's a DSL used to build these forms, and it's pretty ergonomic and you know, all that, blah blah blah. But we're going to see how to use it. We're going to play with it just so we can get a feel, a hang of what exactly does it mean to use a DSL. How does it feel? What exactly does it provide us? Uh, how exactly is it correct? Because I've said that, but you have to experience that too. Um, words don't mean anything unless you like you assign some real meaning to them, and you can only do that by experience, I think. And if any of you want to head to this website, I should have posted a, a short link there. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, this contains an example, which is that example that I showed you. It's lumihq.github.io slash purescript dash lumi dash components slash hash slash form. And this is going to contain this example form there. And yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. That's a good idea. I forgot about that. Thanks to whoever posted that. <laughs> Thank you to whoever posted that. And if any of you is curious about the source code, the source code is here. It's basically like the repo name that you, you've got there. Uh, the, the source code is inside source, uh, is inside docs, examples, and form. And like, I should have actually shown it here too, right? Uh, would have been perhaps a better idea. But you can play with your creativity there. So. Like this form here is described in this declarative language, right? And like all the validations that we perform there, all the whole shape of the form, all the fields, all that happens there is described by this declarative language. And it's rather simple. Simple as, um, this can come later. It's as simple as this, for instance. This thing here, it produces a really simple registration form where you have two fields. One of them is named email. It has this red asterisk before it, meaning that it's required. It's validated to be a non-empty string. It's validated also to be an email, although this is valid email function. I've defined it to be just like checking if it contains uh, an at symbol, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter. And this, this field is a text box. Uh, oh, yeah. Right, so since we're using pure script here, this a do notation, well, who here is familiar with do notation? Mostly everyone, okay. So for those, cool. Uh, I'm going to continue shortly. Now we'll have a break.